So my name's Simon Cox, and I live over in Dearborn, Michigan, just two, about two and a half, three hours away from here. And I live over there with my wife and our four boys, and we've been serving over there for about six years now. Uh, our journey to how we got there, uh, originally, well, I'll back up a little bit. My wife and I, we met in college, and we kind of came together over the love that we both had for missions. We both wanted to proclaim the gospel to those who hadn't heard it yet. We wanted to lead people to Christ, and that's how we came together, uh, became friends, and eventually thought each other were kind of cute, started dating. And um, while we were dating, before we got engaged, Actually, after we got engaged, the Lord put on both of our hearts in separate ways uh, Muslims. We knew we wanted to do missions, but we didn't know where or how. We didn't really know much about what it looked like either. We'd both been on a couple of short-term trips to different places in the country and the world. And again, we knew we wanted to share Jesus, didn't know how or where. We knew we wanted to reach Muslims all of a sudden. So we started praying about where we were going to go. And the Lord led us to do a discipleship training school with YWAM, which is Youth with, a, Youth with a Mission. And we did our training school in Kansas City. And then we went and did an outreach in Thailand, which was, you know, transformative. The Lord did a lot of things uh, in our hearts through that. We still wanted to reach Muslims, though. We were working with a lot of Buddhist um, people out there, and it was great. We learned a ton. And we started praying about what to do, where do we go. And the Lord led us to a conference in Dearborn that George Husney and Horizons were teaching. So we went to this church and had our minds blown. We hadn't really had intensive teaching about reaching out to Muslims yet, so we, we, just, we had no idea. It was incredible. Along with the teaching, in the mornings we were in a church basement learning about Islam, learning about how to share with Muslims, learning about the culture, about Islam. And then in the afternoons we would go out. Dearborn is... It is known to have the most dense population of Arabs outside of the Middle East. There are cities across the USA that have more when it comes to the, you know, the sheer pop number in the population. But when it comes to density, Dearborn, uh, Dearborn takes the win there. So our estimations we, you know, from living there is about probably about 70, 60 to 70 percent of the population in the city of Dearborn is Arab. Uh, if you look on Wikipedia, I think it's 40 percent. I think it's old data. It's 10, 11 years old. Um, and that's just Dearborn which is a city of about 100,000. When you zoom out to the greater metro area, you know, it's two, 300,000 because there's, so many, there's Detroit and then a number of other suburbs. So the population there, Arabs everywhere, it's awesome. And then the majority of them are Muslim. There is a Christian, a traditional Christian population a little bit north. Um, a lot of Chaldeans are up there. But most of the Arabs in the greater metro Detroit area are all Muslim. So, um, so whenever we did this training in Dearborn in the church basement, we went out into the community and had ample opportunity to share with people, to minister, to practice the things that we had just learned and immediately put them into practice and fail and uh, make all sorts of mistakes. But it was great because we were in that teaching environment. So from there, uh, the Horizons crew said, hey, we're doing a four-week training, same stuff, more in-depth, in Boulder. Would you guys like to come? And we had just finished YWAM, newly married, said, sure. Everything we owned was in our car, so we drove out to Boulder, Colorado, and we decided to do the four-week four training. And while we were there, uh, the, the team had said, hey, we have an international student ministry right here directly across the street from Colorado University Boulder. Um, we're having, you know, the staff person is currently leaving. Would you like to come and direct it? And we said, we prayed about it and felt the Lord said yes. So we ended up doing international student ministry. That was a huge blessing. We got to interact with a lot more Arab Muslim students there because, again, in Thailand, we were reaching out primarily to Buddhists and tourists, which was great, but we just felt that longing to really get, dive into conversation with Muslims. So at the university, a lot of Saudi students, a lot of people from Oman, a lot of Gulf students were at the university, and it was, one, it was great. Um, so... Something we noticed when we were hosting events, churches would bring in the volunteers to help us do these, you know, we'd put on events centered around holidays or different, uh, different things for the international students to really help them understand um, what American culture was like. We'd connect them with different families, teach English, and when we did these events, some of our volunteers spoke Arabic, and when we saw that, all of the Arabic student, all the Arab students would flock around them and just surround them. And we, Sarah and I looked at her and so were like, that looks pretty cool. That looks like an immediate connection point. I think we should pray about learning Arabic. So 
Horizons trains people that have gone all over the world. And we didn't know anything about Arabic school or where you learn Arabic. We knew nothing. But we knew of a school through one of our volunteers in Jordan. So we asked the director at the time, um, strategic director, we said, do you know, do Horizons know anyone that we could talk to that might point us where we could learn Arabic? So they connected us with a team in uh, Madaba, Jordan, which is just south of Amman and the capital, southwest. And we did a Skype call and said, hey, we're, we, we want to learn Arabic. What do you think? And the Lord, through a series of different really cool confirming events, uh, led us to go with this missions organization, Team Expansion, to Jordan. And we ended up going over there, studied Arabic, at a school, worked a lot with the Syrian refugees because that was in 2015. Um, the crisis in Syria was all be, you know, beginning in 2010-11. And uh, so there was a lot of refugees that were still coming to Jordan. So we got to do a lot of refugee relief work. Uh, we studied Arabic, and it was incredible. It was difficult for us. Um, it was great, but it, it was tough. And shortly, uh, we, we were there for about 18 months, did Arabic school, and then the Lord, out of nowhere, led us to Dearborn. We were actually we were planning to leave Jordan, didn't know where, and then all of a sudden the, uh, the president of our organization at the time said, hey, I want you guys to pray about leading the team that we have in Dearborn. Uh, and we'd been there for a week, so we kind of knew what it was like, but that was all we knew. So we prayed about it, and the Lord instantly confirmed it in both of our hearts, and we came to Dearborn in 2016. And since then, we've been leading a team doing essentially looking to do, we're trying to lead people to Christ. Heavy emphasis on discipleship and evangelism, Bible studies. Uh, we were able to plug into a number of different ministry centers that are there, different teaching English. There's a lot of people in Dearborn doing a lot of great things, so we've been able to come alongside and to help, to serve, to partner up, and that's been fantastic. And we did that from 2016 till 2021, and since then I've been transitioned to working full-time in real estate as a realtor and real estate investor, which is what I do now. And uh, so that's now our full-time job, how we pay the bills, but we're thankful that we still get to do a lot of outreach, a lot of living in Dearborn is outreach. If you know Jesus and you're in Dearborn, life is outreach, well, if you let it be, which is what we're going to talk about today. It doesn't, doesn't have to be. It's not by default, but because of the the demographics there, there's so much opportunity. So we love being in Dearborn, and uh, I just wanted to share that just so you know who I am. So that's kind of our story and where we're at, and um, I just got to drive over here from Dearborn because it's so close. So we love Horizons. Um, again, we kind of got our start in Muslim ministry through Horizons, through the teaching there. We love the, the DNA of the organization. We love um, how Horizons approaches ministry, the heart that Horizons has for Muslims and for training believers to reach out to Muslims. So anytime Horizons is doing something, we love being a part of it. So anyway, super happy to be here. And um, I'm going to share today about the spiritual factors that go into Muslim ministry. And this is actually a teaching that's pulled from <clears throat> the Engaging Islam course that Horizons does, travels around and does trainings for different churches in different spots. Uh, if any of you are interested in having that training at your church or in your city, definitely reach out to someone at Horizons, and uh, most likely something can be arranged. Um, so this is a teaching that's pulled from that, adapted a little bit for this context. So, so before we get going, I just want to pray for us, and then we will we'll jump right in. Father God, thank you for waking us up this morning. Uh, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. I pray that you would guide me and speak through me this morning as I'm uh, doing my best, Lord, to encourage, to uh, equip. Lord, I pray that you, that all of us would just be um, led more closely uh, to reach out to Muslims, Lord, through this, that we would be convicted, that you would... Uh, reveal what it is that we need to do, what it is we need to change, and anything else that you might have, Lord. We just pray that our hearts would be soft and our ears would be open, Lord. Amen. So how many here are excited about reaching out to Muslims? I love coming to trainings, to conferences, because it just has such an effect where you just feel jazzed up to do it. You know, you hear about these awesome testimonies, you see people doing it, you read these books, you're hearing trainings, and it's just, it makes sense, and it clicks, and it's so fun to think about, and you just want to get out and do it right away. There was, um, I went to a missions training, or no, it was a missions conference when I was in college, and 
big, it's called International Conference on Missions over in the east, southeast part of the country, and just huge conference, tons of exhibitors. Like in the hallway here, we've got, you know, like a few, a handful of missionaries out there. It's like that times like 50, you know, like just, you could just go all day walking through these booths. And they had breakouts just like this. So when I was in college, I went to one, and it was Fouad Mastery with um, Crescent Project. So I went in there, my first time I'd ever heard about reaching out to Muslims. I had no idea. So he, he gave us some cool little strategies, cool little tips of things that we, ways we could start conversations. And this was in Atlanta. And I remember uh, it was a convention center connected to the airport. And I was so inspired and excited. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And they had little handouts that we could have, little tracts or little uh, like Luke's little gospels. So I got one of those. And as soon as the training was over, I just walked through the tunnel and just walked into the airport looking for Muslims. Um, so I just walked around until I found someone at a little, at a table waiting for his flight. I went and sat down with him, introduced myself, started sharing. And I, and I, the, whatever Fouad had told me, I just literally went and tried the exact same thing and it went pretty well he wasn't uh, he didn't you know he didn't hit me he wasn't angry um, he didn't agree necessarily but it was a very civil conversation it was so fun and I walked away from that saying wow it's really that easy you just have to do it so I was I that was really just that really marked me and then each time that I've been at a training or uh, conference and I've felt that again the inspiration or just excitement of learning what I'm hearing others doing it Whenever there's just instant action taken, I've, it, it usually works out really well. There was another time where I came back from some conference or something, some missions weekend, and I, uh, there was a little mosque at our, near my house, and I'd never been there before, so I just walked in, and I hap there happened to be a funeral kind of thing going on, so tons of guys all in this room, and again, I just went and I sat down with someone and started talking and handed them whatever tract or Bible I had and used the things I was taught in that conference and put them right into action, got to share with them. It was great, developed a long-term relationship and was visiting with them until I ended up moving away from Texas where I was uh, born and raised. So, um, but I've just learned that you just, you go learn it and then you go do it. There's just, the enemy's gonna wanna slow you down in the middle, but we just have to do it. And then with Horizons, when we were in Dearborn, we do all this training in the morning, and then you go out and you just do it. Like, we just went out, and here's how we do it. We role play, and we went out into the, in the afternoon, and we just put it into practice. And, uh, and cool stuff happened. So, um, so I've been marked by these sort of trainings and conferences. I don't think it's, uh, I think this, this teaching this morning is a lot about, like, kind of sustainability and making sure that we don't just have to go to a conference or a training or something to be able to get, like, jazzed up and go do something. Because it does help, and it's awesome, and I love these kind of events. But it also, there's, like, there's a lifestyle that we learn to live. And that's what a lot about, that's a lot about what we're going to be talking today. So, um, so one question that we need to ask ourselves, I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions to ask yourself. I don't want to hear the answers. Um, but the motivation... We want to ask ourselves about motivation. Why are we doing this? Why do you want to go reach out to Muslims? Why do you want to walk through an airport terminal and find someone? Or why do you want to hand out these Bibles? Um, and obviously, the obvious answer is because we want people to talk about Jesus. So I understand that, and I think, I think that's going to be the underlying motivation for most of us. But we really have to ask ourselves, like, is my heart full of love for this person? Um, do I truly care about them? Do I really want them to come to Christ? Or is this kind of a fun, is this kind of like a fun thing I'm hyped about right now? Is this a game? Is this a challenge to win? Um, why am I doing this? Because sometimes the conversations go great and they're just super receptive. Other times they're not. And whenever things get tough, that's when like that motivation rises to the surface. And if it's not truly motivated by love for that individual, um, different things can come out. So uh, I've heard different preachers say, or my dad told me, he goes, we're kind of like toothpaste, you know, like when you get squeezed, what's inside comes out. So, um, and that's us. And when we get squeezed and put under pressure, what's truly inside comes out. So that's why it's good to ask ourselves what that motivation is. Um, and again, why we're doing it. Uh, I heard a cool story about just a little example uh, of let's just say it was in Spain, I don't know, some European country. But imagine there's a couple, three different guys, and they're all making bricks. So they're molding the clay, and they're making the bricks, setting them out in the sun to dry and harden up. They're making bricks, and someone walks up and says, hey, what are you guys doing? One of them just says, I'm making bricks. Just not happy to see you, just making bricks. And I'll go, okay, okay, sorry. It goes to the next guy, what are you doing? I'm making bricks to build a wall. And they're like, okay, 
cool. And he goes to the next guy and says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm making bricks that are going to be in a wall that are going to be building a church so that people can come and give glory to our God who created everything. All three of them are doing the exact same thing, but like one of them knows why he's doing it and his motivation is different. How do you think he's carrying out the mundane task that making bricks isn't fun, it's hard work, it's not glamorous, but he knows why he's doing it and it helps him to come about it from a completely different different approach. Um, So when we're going about reaching out to Muslims, like obviously salvation, the, the process of someone's heart being transformed and someone coming to Christ, that is purely the work of God. There is nothing you're going to say. There's no switch you can flick. That you, we, we are messengers. We bring love. We bring the gospel. We bring truth. But for someone's heart to truly be transformed, that is purely a work of God. And if we don't approach it like that, we put a lot more pressure on ourselves than I think is healthy um, or necessary. And we're going to break this kind of into two sections about uh, in the process of someone coming to Christ, in the process of a Muslim becoming a believer, there's our role and there's God's role. And we're, pro- we're going to spend more time on our role because God, he, he's got his role pretty, you know, he's got his role down. So we're going to refine our approach to our role just to really, again, examine, look inside to see if how we're doing, if there's anything the Lord would have us adjust or change. Um, so, Again, the idea of someone coming to faith is, it's crazy. It's huge. It's, it's such, a, such an amazing thing to think that a heart it actually gets transformed. It's not just, I agree to this set of beliefs and this set of thinkings. I thought this way, and now I agree with this. It's not just an intellectual transition or shift. It's, an act, it's a true transformation of someone's heart. Now, how does that happen? just want to go through some scriptures here, some of my, uh, some of my favorite uh, verses that just point to this work being uh, from the Father. Um, John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. No one can come unless the Father draws him. We're drawing people, we're calling people, inviting people, sharing with people, but unless the Father calls them, it's not happening. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. John 16:8. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He being the Holy Spirit, of course. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts of these things, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Um, Has anyone here ever tried to convict someone, maybe your spouse, of their sin? It doesn't work so well. Um, I've found often, and mostly my wife for me, when she backs up a little bit, and then the Lord convicts me really quickly. So again, the Spirit is the one who convicts us. It's not, we cannot bring that conviction. We can bring guilt. We can bring pressure. Um, and again, bringing truth is not bringing guilt. I'm not saying that sharing truth is bringing guilt. We share truth, and the Spirit is the one who brings the conviction in the hearts. Again, His job, not ours. 1 Corinthians 12.3 says that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Obviously, anyone can say the words Jesus is Lord. That's not the point here. But to truly say Jesus is Lord, he is, uh, he is everything. I am fully submitted to him. That doesn't happen except by the Holy Spirit's work in your heart to transform your heart, to submit you to him and create a son or a daughter from you. Uh, Luke 24, 31, <clears throat> and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Uh, this is the people who are speaking to the risen Lord after on the road to Emmaus. And um, it, their eyes were opened. It doesn't say like they put the pieces together all of a sudden by their intellect and understanding. It says their eyes are open. They were walking and talking with him. I don't know exactly how long it was. Um, I'm sure it's been figured out. I just don't know. But all of a sudden, it was, it was covered from them. And all of a sudden, their eyes were opened. I believe that God opened their eyes and decided in this moment, now it's time for me to show you what's going on here. Now it's time for you to know what's in front of you. So again, it's the Lord's work opening that. We're going to keep going one more. Matthew 16, 16 and 17. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Jesus is saying, God gave you that revelation. God showed you that he told you who I am. And that's exactly what we want for our, you know, for our Muslim friends. God to open their eyes and all of a sudden they get it. Oh, 
This is Jesus we're speaking to. Oh, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. It's from God. He's the one who opens their eyes and gives that revelation. And the reason I just kind of went through all those verses is because I feel like it lays such a clear foundation or just really drives home the point of salvation and someone's heart being transformed is truly the work of God. Like, that's Him who does that. And again, He uses us, praise God, through His wisdom, but it is His work. <clears throat> And God's role in us. Uh, in Philippians 2.13, uh, this is the NLT version, it says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. He's the one working in us. Anything good that we're doing, anything, any righteousness that shows up in our life, that's Him working inside of us. He's, His Spirit gives us the power to do these things. It's None of it's on our own merit, our own, our own goodness. It's all Him working in us. Um, and... In, again, in his wisdom, he's decided that he wants to use us, his children, to lead people to Christ. He wants to use us. We are his co-workers. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9, uh, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. God has been making it grow. And he says that twice in there, and it says God makes things grow. So again, God is doing the work. We're in there. I heard Paul and Apollos, they're in there, one's watering, one's planting. So there is active work on the part of the believer doing these things, but God is the one who brings the growth. There's no confusion there. But how cool that we get to be God's co-workers. Like what an honor, what a privilege, what a, uh, what a gift that is that he says, I want you to work here with me. I want you to do this with me. I believe that I think God could have done it a number of ways. Why did he choose it this way? I think obviously he desires relationship. He desires that intimacy and closeness with us in doing his work to, that we get to be working about our father's work. So obviously there's relationship there um, as we, of course, as we work and as we are doing the things that are on God's heart, we learn about him more. We grow closer with him. So it's a beautiful system he's set up, but I just can't can't, when I really sit and think about it, I can't, it's, it kind of messes with my head a little bit about what an honor it is that God calls us as sinful as we are. We've all been made righteous. You know, if we believe in Christ, we're made righteous and we are sons and daughters. Um, but obviously we're flawed. We all know that. We all are very aware of our shortcomings. But even so, God has chosen to use us in his work and say, yeah, come on, let's do this together. And we're just like, me? Like, are you sure? So uh, I, I don't know. It, it blows my mind. So again, I'm going to go through a few verses here and point out a couple of things that we have to make sure our success or our progress in ministry, our, even our confidence in ministry, does not come from. And I would say will not come from even. So the first thing, human wisdom or eloquence of speech. Um, I think I love listening to people like Josh McDowell and Abdul Murray. Amazing. You know what I'm saying? But... And I love it. And I, every time I do, I just like want to buy all their books. And I did already. So, <laughs> so I love it. You know, and I want to learn. I want to become more well-versed. And I think we absolutely should. Um, one thing we have to be careful of, though, is that that's not what we're relying on or what we're confident in. Should we be prepared? I love what Josh McDowell said the first night. He said that um, <laughs> he kind of ragged on people who said, I'm just going to trust the Spirit. Um, now, again, we all need to trust the Spirit. He wasn't saying don't trust the Spirit. But what he was saying was... We, how, how he even say, he used the word lazy. How lazy to just say, I'm just going to trust the Spirit, which in what it means, what's behind that is saying, I'm not going to prepare. I'm not going to learn or study or dive deep into this. I'll just let the Spirit do it. So again, there's tension there because it is all the Spirit's work. We do need to rely on Him in everything. But I do agree, it's a little bit lazy to not do the work on that. So even though we do need to study and be prepared and equipped, that can't be where our confidence comes from. We can't go into a conversation with a Muslim feeling on top of the world because we know five different brilliant you know, apologetic points. Should we know them? Absolutely. Is that why we need to go in confident? No. Our confidence needs to be in the spirit inside of us and in God's love and hope for that person to come to Christ. 
Uh, and again, that's in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, 2, uh, 1, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, I, it's two of my favorite chapters because it just, every time I read them, it brings me right down to earth and says, oh yeah, it's the Lord's work. It's, he's not looking for eloquent wisdom or speech or any of these things. It makes me feel like, oh, I can do this because again, I also watch people like Josh McDowell, Abdul Murray, and George, and I think, wow, I got a lot to learn. Like, I'm not ready to do ministry or go talk to someone. But then I read these and I remember, yes, it's the Spirit. And I'm growing in my understanding and knowledge of things I can share. Um, And I will get there, but I'm not on the sidelines until I'm at a certain level. Because again, it's the Spirit inside of us. Um, Another thing is just the strength or number of workers. Again, I don't think God doesn't need a lot to do a lot. Um, God can do a lot because of who he is. The stories of this in the Bible are countless, especially in the Old Testament. Um, in Judges 7, uh, who remembers how many people, how many army uh, soldiers Gideon went into battle with? Anybody remember? 300. Yep, that's what my notes say. I mean, <laughs> um, so 300. Um, and then does anyone remember how many he started with? Yeah, 32,000. So he started with 32,000 down to 300. Um, That's a very small percentage. I think, is that 1%? Yep, just about 1%. So God doesn't need to, he doesn't need a lot to do a lot. If my math was wrong on that, please forgive me. It's early. Um, Something else that's not going to help us as we go into, um, I'm going to grab my Bible here. Something else God does not need and something else that we are not go- is not going to help us to succeed in ministry is, uh, is not being bold. Uh, the Bible is extremely clear on us needing to be uh, bold as we go out. And um, 2 Timothy 1.7. Um, for God gave us a spirit of... For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And then Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power unto salvation uh, for all who believe. So if we are not being bold with that, it's likely that we are not going to see a lot of fruit or a lot of uh, interest in the gospel if you're not sharing it. And again, that, that should, be, should go without saying. Um, and I'm, I'm going to touch more on that later, so I'm going to put a pause on that. Uh, another thing that could slow us down and we won't see our success uh, come from is, um, is working in the flesh and, and, again, using the weapons of this world. In Ephesians 6.12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, again, this is a spiritual battle, and we are... Um, we need to remember that as we go in and not just coming at it from a fleshly perspective. Um, So as we go forward in ministry, um, using the right tools is crucial. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has tried to do a job or complete a task using the wrong tool, either because you don't have it or you don't want to go out to the garage to get it. Uh, It leads to a lot of frustration. I've been in this position many times trying to change the oil on my car. Uh, My neighbors have thought I'm crazy as I'm standing on the hood of my truck or in the engine of my truck trying to get something out because I don't have the right tool. I go to AutoZone, pick the right one, get it, and I go like this and it's done. So, I mean, having the right tool makes all the difference. And I'm not calling the Holy Spirit um, a tool in ministry, but if we're not using, um, if we're not coming about it the right way, it leads to frustration, to anger, to failure, to burnout. There's so many different things that can happen when we're trying to accomplish these things uh, in our own strength and approaching them from the wrong way. Um, So, again, Going back to the way that we feel when we go to these kind of conferences and things, um, I'm a, I love playing soccer. My sons do as well. My seven-year-old, he's, you know, he's really getting into it now. And um, sometimes what we'll do is like we'll, we'll jump on YouTube or something and we'll watch highlights of you know, Lionel Messi or Ronaldo or just you know, like some of the best of the best. We'll watch these highlights. And as we watch them, we just get like excited and our feet like they're tingling and we want to go like play soccer all of a sudden. And we feel like, wow. I want to go do this. And it often leads us to feeling like we're better than we are. And then we go outside and think, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then, you know, 
com looks completely different. Maybe it feels the same to, in, to me, but it looks completely different. But again, watching those who are brilliant inspires us to do these things and then wants us to go do it right away, which is good. I think that's great. And that's kind of how I feel sometimes when I come to these conferences. I listen to Abdul Murray and I take some notes. And I'm like, okay, great. And then I go into this conversation and I'm like, you know, stumbling over my words as I'm trying to, again, just remember, repeat, or even parrot what I've just heard which isn't bad, I think that's what we're supposed to do is go out and take this action. But reliance on the spirit in doing this is huge. Um, and I want to just point out, like, there's no, there's no silver bullets when it comes to, uh, to ministry with Muslims. There's not a phrase or one specific uh, piece of truth or one fact against the, the Quran or Islam. or there's, no, there's not, like, one key that just unlocks someone's heart. Like, it's just not true. I wish it were. Um, I wish there was something we could say, like one thing that's like, I know what to do. I'm just going to share this, and all of a sudden, they're going to get it. Like, it's just not true. So I want to like really just point that out. And if that's not true, and there isn't just one thing that we have to learn or one little uh, approach that we need to master how to deliver, if it's not the case, w how do we know what we're supposed to say? How do we know what's worth our time to share? Or how, how do we know what to do? It's intimidating, overwhelming, and can often just kind of make you want to pull back and say, I don't know what's going to do it. It's too hard. I don't want to do it. I'm intimidated. I don't want to take the time. I don't know. And again, that's why we're going to really bring in, and I feel, if it feels like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, I am, um, which is that's why we need to rely on the Spirit. We have to walk by the Spirit. We have to learn to listen to His voice as we're ministering. Because as we put all these tools in our tool belt, the Lord will use every, you know, who knows what he's going to use? I don't know. But again, we have to rely on him to point out, hey, say this. Hey, share this verse. Because we can't see people's hearts. He sees their hearts and he knows what they're saying. Last night, Abdul Murray said, questions don't need answers. People do. So if someone throws out all these objections at you, if you're just thinking about it in a fleshly or intellectual way, and this is, I'm, I do this often, I'll say, oh, I got to tell them why that's not right. Oh, actually, that's not true because of this. Oh, actually, history has shown this. And I, like, I get all clogged up as I'm trying to think of what to say. But when I back away from that, and now, again, there's some context that's okay. Like if you're sitting at a table having hours-long conversation, going through things, no problem. But oftentimes, in my experience, it's not that all these need to be answered. It's, Holy Spirit, what, what, what's going on here? What do I need to point to? What do I need to address? What do I need to leave alone? What do I need to, what is being asked here? Do I need to answer any of these questions? Do I need to go totally around all of them and say something else? There's, whenever you're with a Muslim friend talking, be praying constantly. Make sure you're listening. Don't pray. Don't listen. But make sure you're praying and saying, like, Spirit, lead me, guide me, guide me. And if you're going with a Muslim friend, whether it's, um, it's a planned meeting or whatever, let someone else know. Tell them, hey, pray for me. I'm going to be hanging out with Muhammad, and I, I just I want the Lord to lead this time. I want him to lead this conversation because I long for him to know Jesus. And the Spirit knows what needs to happen. Uh, go with a friend. If you're with someone else, when one person's talking, have the other one just be constantly praying, praying, praying. Uh, not out loud, that'd be weird, but I mean, you know, in their heart. Uh, and oftentimes when we've gone out and done evangelism or meeting with different Muslim friends, we'll go in pairs just because uh, one, it just helps in conversation so that, you know, one person shares. But while the one person's talking, praying, praying, praying. We're praying that the Lord softens the heart, that the Lord leads whoever's speaking to say the right thing. Um, and here, here's, uh, again, from Scripture, a few examples of the Spirit's interaction with believers as they're going out to proclaim the gospel. And these are, um, these are all from Acts, actually. Um, Acts 13, 2. While they were ministering to the Lord, and bless you, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So, ministering to the Lord and fasting. And again, these are things that when we read the Bible... It won't speak for you. For me, sometimes I just glaze over them and just keep going. Um, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Paul and Barnabas. That's really specific. So imagine, again, praying. You're just praying for your, for your life with your, with your husband or your wife. And you're just praying, and um, then the Holy Spirit says something that clear. He named two people specifically and said, I want them for this. That's really specific. That's really cool. 
that the Holy Spirit does that. Um, Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. This is at the Jerusalem Council. They're trying to figure out what the rules are for the Gentiles. And I just, again, I love the, the approach that he gives. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us Almost as if, with, this is what, hap, what is happening, but to visualize it is pretty cool. Uh, imagine the apostles in the chairs sitting around and then the Holy Spirit's in one of them. And they're all talking, is that the same good to you? He's like, yeah, that seems good. You know? It's like the Holy Spirit, like, it seemed good to the Spirit and to us to do this. Such like a, an inclusion there. It's, they're not just trying to figure this out on their own. They're intimately inviting him into this conversation. And I believe strongly he's actively speaking as well. Um, Acts 8.29 uh, this is Philip and the centurion. So again, Philip's doing his thing. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Again, very specific. It doesn't say that he had a vision and Jesus popped up and said, hey, look over there. It says, he, Philip is just going along and it says, hey, Holy Spirit said, go up to this chariot. And we know what happens. He goes and shares with this person and they get baptized in a puddle. Pretty amazing. But again, that's very, very specific. He, he's speaking and he's leading. He's involved in the ministry. And then Acts 16, 6 and 7. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. That's pretty cool. It's almost strange. They, again, this is, we want to go and proclaim the gospel in Asia. We're going to go do this. And the Holy Spirit's like, no, actually, let's not do that. Like, that is so specific. And they, they obeyed that, obviously. And then they said, let's go over here. Let's go to Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus was like, no, no, I'm not going to go that way. I think that is so cool. And I, I believe that this, we still, the Spirit is still doing this. Again, these are believers after, this, after Jesus has come, died, rose again, given the Spirit to all people. And now, you know, Christ is in heaven. And these are the believers walking with the Lord, proclaiming the gospel, trying to grow the kingdom, and the Holy Spirit saying, ah, let's do this, let's do this. Yep, that sounds great. Hey, go do that. No, nope, not there. I think that is so cool. And if we can grasp that, I think there's so much potential for, I, and I guess, being more effective uh, in doing exactly what the Lord is doing. Now, I don't think that the Lord has any intention of this being an anxious trying to figure things out. Like, what should I do, Lord? Which, which bathroom stall should I use? And just like praying like, uh, you know, like, I don't know. You know, it's not, he's not trying to create anxiety and like every step has to be as the Lord is doing. And if, if it feels like that, I would suggest to you there may be something off in your approach or thinking to it because I don't think that's how the Lord intended it, that you have to do everything exactly this way. If you don't sit in this chair, you're disobeying or you missed it. I don't think that's what he's doing. I think it's a partnership he invites us into that can be so rich and so fruitful for the kingdom. Um, there's a, a podcast I want to recommend to you that uh, my pastor recently shared with me, um, <clears throat> and I don't I don't have any PowerPoints or anything, but it is called The Place We Find Ourselves. Uh, it's a podcast, and then episode 38. Uh, it's kind of an old one, so you have to scroll a little bit to get to it. Um, I'm trying to find this here. Uh, I'm, I hope it's 38. I'll, it'll pop up in my notes in a minute. Uh, anyway, it's, the podcast is called The Process of Learning to Hear the Voice of God, um, and it's a very well put together um, podcast explaining very practically, again, he starts kind of backing things up on what it means to, does the Lord speak? Like, do, is he speaking and can we hear his voice? Uh, kind of makes a case for that and then goes really practical. It's a short podcast, less than 45 minutes, but it's, I've listened to it four or five times. I'm going to be listening to it again today. It's just, it's kind of blowing my mind a little bit. It's so simple, but again, what he explains there in that relationship, like any relationship is based on that communication. It's just, I want that so badly, and I've learned, and I've heard the Lord's voice a number of times, not audibly, I know some people have, but again, in, in our spirit, I've heard it, and I want to do that more, because I want to be doing the things my Father's doing in ministry. I want to be following Him directly, and I believe that that's possible to do. So, I'm going to move on from, um, from that idea for now. Um, some other spiritual factors that go into ministering to Muslims is your, I guess, your daily not your daily, but your lifestyle. What are you doing? Are you positioning yourself to hear from God? Are you positioning yourself to be in contact with other Muslims? 
other Muslims, with Muslims. Um, are, you, are you praying for your Muslim friends? Um, the place we find ourselves? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not familiar with the podcast other than this episode, but it's the place we find ourselves, episode 38. You know? Oh, okay, yeah, you get the podcast. Yeah, yeah, the place we find ourselves, episode 38. You've got to scroll down a little bit to get to it. Um, so, but how are we positioning ourselves? And some things, again, just questions I want you to ask, like, <clears throat> are you seeking the Lord? Not for the sake of being able to minister. Like, are you reading your Bible because you want to know Jesus and you want to become more like him? Or are you reading it to stack up your ammunition to have a good argument or debate? Again, nothing wrong with being prepared for a debate. Nothing wrong with knowing the word, knowing apologetics. But why are you studying the Bible? Why are you reading it? Like, is it to know him? Because that's our ultimate goal as believers is to know Christ and to make him known. If we're, if we're doing it just for other purposes and not truly to just know him better, um, I, don't, I don't know if that's the best approach. I don't know if that's why we need to be diving into scripture and seeking him. So are you seeking him? Are you having that time, whether it's alone or with other corporate, you know, corporately? Are you, are you spending time in worship? Are you praying? Are you truly trying to know him? Do you, are you reading your Bible Again, these are really basic like youth group questions, but are you doing those things? If people became, if you lead a, a Muslim to Christ and you are the main person who's kind of discipling them and leading them, would it be good for them to look like you? Are you, are you? Is your life in Christ something worth multiplying? Would it be good if there was more of you walking around your city or would it be not so good? And again, questions to ask ourselves, not, definitely not looking to put any condemnation, just asking you to ask the questions. It's like, do I know him? Am I seeking him? Am I in a position where I could lead someone else to seek him and to know him more? Can I, does my life show, does my life reflect what it looks like to be a son or daughter of God? How's your heart? How's, how's purity? Are you living in sin? Is there hidden sin? Are you, working, are you walking alongside people who are going to help you stay away from these things? Are you, like, I think it's very interesting that, um, and I don't think this is very common. I haven't gone to a lot of conferences lately, but um, to both the main speakers, they've both already spoke very openly about pornography, hidden sin, the effect of it on the church. I, I just found that really interesting. And as that happened the second time last night, I was like, okay, Lord, are you, are you saying something here? Like, I, th I believe, well, I think he's 100% correct. Um, Josh said it was, I don't know, 57% of evangelical pastors and 45% of all believers, something like that, are actively doing this. And, like, again, no condemnation, no shame in these things. Obviously, it's a sin. It's wrong. Uh, there is grace. There is freedom. So, again, not, not condemning at all. But how's your, how's your heart? Are you engaging in hidden sin? Do you have someone that you're walking with in life who's going to help pull these things into the light so that your witness is not hindered? So that you're the... Because again, are you still a child of God if you're like struggling with sin and trying to like, of course. But again, I know from experience, sin hinders your witness. It hinders the, your connection to the Lord. The connection's there, but it just becomes hazy and fuzzy and you can't see it. It's harder to believe. It's harder to act on those things when you know there's sin in your life. So is your life free of sin? How's family life? How's your marriage? How's, how's, your, life, how's your relationship with your kids? These kind of things are important to ask. And again, there are rougher seasons in life than others, no question. It doesn't mean that if you're going through a rough patch in marriage that you can't go witness to your friend. That's not what that means. The enemy would love for you to believe that. But are you actively pouring into your family? Uh, is the relationship with your children strong? Are you working on these things? Because if you're not, and you're just trying to become a better apologist or witness, again, that's a great thing, but what's it, what is it at the cost of? And again, these are just things we need to ask, because if you're going to lead someone to Christ, there's a good chance that your lives are going to be like this for a long time. The people are going to see what your life is like, and is that a good thing? Do you want them to see that, or are you just going to have to pretend more and just show them what you think they should see, which is just white-knuckling, white it's pretending, and it's, it usually doesn't work. Um, because again, discipleship is messy. Discipleship is life on life. We're not just supposed to share the gospel. We share our lives with people. So that's why it's good to ask the Lord, Lord, reveal, my, reveal what's in my heart. If there's anything that isn't, that's in here that shouldn't be there, please refine me. And that's a constant walk of the believer to do those things. But I believe that, again, not saying you have to be perfect to do these things, but I think that's our heart posture should be that 
if we're going to be actively looking to share and to witness and to lead people to Christ. Our heart posture has to be correct. The Lord is gracious. He will work with us and teach us and refine us. He is so good and so patient. Um, but if our hearts aren't postured towards Him correctly, it's really easy to continue uh, in ministry while those things are happening. And I think the Lord has given many of us gifts. You can still walk in your gifting in a number of ways and not be right with the Lord. If you're a great speaker or if you are really smart, like you can continue doing those things and be living in sin. Doing, doing good on stage or doing, having a good argument, or, that doesn't mean that you're right with the Lord. It just means that you're really good at A, B, or C. So again, these are just questions that we need to always continue to ask ourselves. Um, and then 1 Corinthians 13, you could know it all. You know, you can do all these things, but if your heart, if you, don't have, if you don't have love, it's nothing. I could give my body to be burned, give away everything I have, know all the tongues of wisdom. If, it doesn't matter. If your heart is not coming from a position of love, if you don't know he loves you and acting out of love for your friends, it, it's just, you're, it's annoying, a clanging cymbal. Imagine if I just had a clanging cymbal here and I'm smashing it together. Like, that'd be really annoying. So, <laughs> um, and something that I love about Muslim ministry specifically is it's really hard. Muslim ministry... It's not, uh, it's, not just, it's not just super easy. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of spiritual warfare. And the reason I like that is because it constantly reminds me of my incompetence, of my inability to do it on my own strength. Um, I'm constantly faced with the fact that, wow, I can't do it. Well, I did just use every cool argument that I learned from Abdu Murray, and this guy still has no clue. Like, that happens. And again, I'm thankful for that because it constantly points me back to him. It constantly pushes me back to prayer and reliance on the spirit, which is the only way any of it's going to get done anyway. So that's, again, I'm thankful for that because it's a hard reminder um, that that's what it's going to take is working with the spirit in this. Um, so I just want to go through a couple of, uh, one thing I want to point out before we do, just give a couple practical tips. Um, I think praying for our Muslim friends is so important. Um, I'm, I kind of have that type A personality, organized spreadsheets, lists, things like that. But like, do you have a list of like friends that don't believe that you long to know Christ? Pray through that list. Are you praying for people? Because again, that works when nothing else does. Um, a quick example, we have a, a good friend of ours in Michigan and uh, he's a young believer um, wasn't discipled very well when he came to Christ, and we're just like walking with him and um, from a Muslim background. Um, and he, young guys, so you know, like as far as like closeness with the Lord and focus, you know, it's kind of all over the place. But when he was a little bit younger, uh, he actually started living in sin big time, Mo left the state, was living with someone he shouldn't be living with. Uh, we were just like, well, okay, this is interesting. And so we're praying for him, praying for him, praying for him. And um, someone else, he had an opportunity to go to this missions training school and just like totally went off into left field. And we're like, what's going on? We're praying. So I'm out of town. I'm in Texas visiting family. And I get a phone call late at night from him. And I'm just like, I'm like, hey, man, what's up? Like, and I let him know. It's like, hey, man, what you're doing, this isn't right. This is sinful. I love you. I'm here for you. I'm not judging you. I just want you to know that like, I don't, I don't approve of this. I don't think it's good. Um, I'm praying for you, man. I love you. Let me know if you need anything. And I just kind of left it at that, praying for him. He calls me out of nowhere and says, I've been running from God. I'm totally ignoring him. I know what he wants me to do. I need to stop doing this right now. I want to go to this missions training school. And I'm like, dude, it's in like five days. Like, what do you, <laughs> and I said, you got some work to do. I said, I'll help you. And I said, he goes, he was in some other state. And I was like, well, I pulled up my phone. I was like, well, there's a train leaving for Detroit in, at 6 a.m. This is like midnight. And he's like, I'll be there. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, all right, cool. And I was like, all right, well, here it is. He was in Michigan the next morning. He totally came, ran out of sin, flipped around, and then they went to the, he went to the missions training school for five months. And now he lives with us and is like doing great, loves the Lord, is just like doing amazing. It's just like, but that came out of nowhere. Again, all what we did was we're praying for him, and it was the Lord who turned his heart around. It was nothing else. Like, we didn't come and give him a long lecture, or ABC, like what well, we did. But like, you know, <laughs> so it's like, it's the Lord's work in his heart and completely did it. So like, are you praying for your friends? And again, it could be a long prayer. We just had a really cool visit from 
when we worked in Colorado, we did the international student ministry, and there was one Saudi student we connected with, um, just one of our best buddies, and uh, he was like 18, 19, so he just with us all the time. We were, we were, it was just us, we didn't have kids yet, and, um, but he just visited us from Saudi Arabia last week, and um, he still doesn't know the Lord yet, um, but he came and like, again, lived with us, staying in our house, being with our kids, watching us get mad at our kids, spank our kids. It's just like, he got to see like, you know, life as, life as life actually is, not as it looks from the outside. Um, and we're still praying for him. Um, he loves being around believers. Like he went to Colorado, visited George as well. And, um, but we're still praying for him. How long will it take? I don't know. Hopefully sooner than later. But I'm, because of what I know the Lord can do, I'm confidently and hopefully praying, knowing that, hey, Khaled's going to know the Lord at some point. Like he's going to know the Lord. And I can't wait for that moment to happen, and I have no idea how it will. But I know it's possible, and I know that's God's heart. There are certain things you pray for you just know are the Lord's will, and it just like you just come into that throne room with confidence saying, like, Lord, please do this. And, um, and in his timing, he does. So, uh, so just, I guess, a couple of um, tips, I guess. Uh, when it comes to, so again, like I said, I work in real estate, and... Um, I've got a, a mentor that I work with that's helping me, you know, grow the business and everything. And at times, on a Wednesday, Thursday, I'll just be really discouraged and down. I'm like, man, the business just isn't like, it's just not coming. Like, ah, you know, like, what am I doing? And then, so I kind of share that. And he's like, well, how many people did you talk to today? And I'm just like, oh, yeah. So it's just like, are you, I mean, what he's saying is, are you doing the things that are going to lead to what you want? And I was like, nope. And then I have my answer. And again, so there's that discouragement. And if I don't bring that to someone or if I'm not honest with myself, that depression comes, not depression, but you get like discouraged. You start getting a long list of excuses about why it's not working. Um, you may try other things, get distracted and totally put your efforts somewhere else. So the question is, are you doing the things that are going to lead you to what you want to accomplish? And again, that's really simple stuff. But when it comes to ministry, do you want to lead Muslims to Christ? Great. Are you hanging out with Muslims? Are you praying for opportunities? Are you going to places where you will run into them? Are you learning the things that you should say? Are you reading cool books that are going to share testimonies or practical tips? Are you doing those things? And if you're not, I mean, that's why ministry is not going to happen. Again, it's the Lord's work. But again, <laughs> the verse I want to share on this is from Matthew 9. Um, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So is the harvest plentiful? Yes. Jesus said that. It's true. The harvest is plentiful, but what is few? The workers. Are we showing up for work? God wants to do the God wants to save Muslims. He wants to bring people to Christ, but are we showing up and saying I'm ready? Are you stepping out of your comfort zone and going to these going to hang out with Muslims, going somewhere where you're going to reach out to someone? Is it uncomfortable? Yes, of course. But if we want to see things happen, uh, I really believe that we have, to, we have to take action to do these things. We can't just sit there, read a cool book, and say, I want to reach out to Muslims, and then wait for someone to come to you. Now, again, that may happen, and it has happened, where someone comes and sits next to you on a bench and says, I had a dream. Like, sure, that can happen. But that's not what we need. That shouldn't be our expectation. That shouldn't be our ministry strategy, is to just go sit and wait for someone to talk to you. Um, again, if the Lord does that, praise God. That's awesome but I would challenge you if that's your strategy. So I would say go out and put yourself in that position. Are you, are you seeking after the Lord with everything you have? Are you in scripture and praying for people every day? Are you showing yourself as one who's approved and ready to be used, ready to be a coworker, ready to be a laborer with him? Are you doing that? Are you showing God, I want to be used by you? And does your life reflect that? So again, make a goal of saying, I love goals. If you don't, if it doesn't resonate with you, I get that. But say it like, I want, to, I want to share the gospel with one person each week, whether it's a Muslim or not. I would love to do that. And then show up. Is it going to be, is it just going to feel forced sometimes? Probably. Is, is it going to go great every time? No. But what if you just put yourself out there and try to do these practical things that are going to help you? Pray for 10 people by name each day. 
every day go somewhere where you're going to reach out to Muslims or once a week. Make it easy. Make it attainable. Don't say I'm going to share the gospel with 10 people every day. Don't do that. It's probably not going to happen. And if it does, it'll, you'll do three days in a row and be done. So set realistic goals and then just start putting yourself out there seeking the Lord, relying on the Spirit, and watch Him give you opportunities. Again, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. He is doing a lot among Muslims. A lot of Muslims are coming to Jesus, and a lot of people, a lot of Muslims don't know where to go about it. So go make yourself available for the Holy Spirit, for Him to use you, and I, I bet money that he, He's going to use you. But again, take that action and show up, and then watch the Lord move. Um, and just remember, it's his work, not ours. We have to show up and do what we're supposed to do, but he's the one that transforms hearts. So, so yeah, that's really it. Um, I guess let me just pray for us real quick, and then uh, it's 9.30, so we got to go. Father God, thank you so much for your work in our hearts and your work in the hearts of those who do not yet know you. We want to offer ourselves up uh, as living sacrifices um, and commit ourselves to you, Lord, as co-workers in your field, as laborers for the harvest that we believe is plentiful. I pray that you would convict us and lead us and that you would show us the things that are going to lead to us being able to participate with you in ministry, Lord. If there's things in our hearts that are hindering us, um, that are causing us to not be ready, let us know. Reveal, Lord. Search our hearts and know us. And if there's any wicked way in us, Lord, lead us in the way that's everlasting. Refine us. We invite you to convict us. And again, teach us what we need to do so that we can be a part uh, of Muslims coming to Christ. That's what we long for. That's what we desire. And we know that you're doing it. And we ask that you lead us to where you are working. Help us to, be, to get out of our comfort zones. Help us to step out in faith, in boldness. And would we rely on your spirit in those things and see your hand in our lives and in the lives of those around us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.